mode. Good day. Uh, I want to welcome all of you for joining us uh, for this webinar sponsored by Vivid and brought to you by HP and SAP. Uh, today we're going to learn how um, here we're going to learn how SAP ensures their applications are secure against data breaches using the HP Fortify solution. Next slide. So again, this, uh, this webinar is brought to you in conjunction with HP Enterprise and the Vivid organization. This is a very unique webinar in the sense that it's spanning four continents this, uh, today. We have people here in the United States, in Asia, in Australia, and Europe uh, working together to bring all of you this, um, this webinar. Next slide. My name is Robert Linton, and I'm a vice president for an organization in the United States called Cortex. And we have been an HP partner since uh, 2007. And I am also one of the SIG leaders for the uh, Total Quality uh, organization. And it's my pleasure to help monitor this webinar tonight for all of you that are joining us from all over the world. Next slide. Today we have um, the privilege of having Barbara Cody uh, with us to talk about um, the quality assurance and security solutions as they apply to SAP. Uh, Barbara joins us from Australia. We're also honored to have Shlomi, uh, who is one of the Fortified Business Managers in the Asia Pacific region. And of course, we have uh, the folks from Vivid and, uh, and myself. Next slide. So before we get um, into the actual webinar, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping uh, items for all of you. One of them is that this is a live session and it is being recorded and the recordings will be available to all Vivid members after the webinar. Uh, take a couple of days for the um, recording to be posted on the Vivid website and uh, also the slides and any questions and answers will also be posted to the Vivid website after the uh, couple of days after the webinar is concluded. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to type your questions into the question pane, which is located on the right side of your screen. You should be able to see um, there's a couple of different areas, but if you find the area that says questions, you can actually undock it by hitting the uh, up arrow key, not, not the X, but the up arrow key next to the X, which will help you to undock that questions panel. And you can type in your questions and the organizers and the presenters will be able to see your questions. And then at the end of the presentation, uh, time permitting, we will get to as many of those questions and answer them for you. And again, <clears throat> if you don't hear your question answered, you can um, look for it in a couple of days on the Vivid website and all the questions that are that have been submitted will have an answer at that time. Next slide, please. Oh, this is actually what I just was going over. Uh, you can see that you have this uh, webinar control panel and for the most part, you just need to work with the questions and um, put in your questions and we'll get to them at the uh, end of the webinar. Next slide. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Barbara. Barbara, all yours. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, you have heard this is a global event, so I want to welcome everybody in all the different time zones that we have. Um, my name is Barbara Cody, and I will take probably around the next 30 to 40 minutes to talk about application security how SAP actually tackles SAP application security and what we recommend to our customers. So I'm going to spend that with you and as you might have heard already, we have a few different accents obviously on the um, presentation today. As you would probably have um, expected, SAP always comes with German. So I'm actually originally from Germany, but I live in Australia for the last 11 years. And, look, and I'm looking after the quality assurance solutions for APJ. 
I have a long background in security, specifically coming from Germany, which is one of the countries I believe actually had the first security regulations and laws in place already in what I nowadays occasionally refer to as computer stone age. So I was working at that time at a large German conglomerate and I was responsible when we were implementing IBM 36, which is, if you, if you haven't heard of it, it's basically the preceder of the AS400. So this is a long time ago. I was responsible to make sure that all sensitive data were protected and that nobody that had no equivalent authorization could actually access that. In these days, this was fairly simple to do because we had an IBM 36 system that, that connected into a mainframe. Nowadays, and where we are with digital transformation and the fourth industrial revolution going on, everything has dramatically changed. So we have total different environments and protecting applications and protecting data and the assets that we have as organizations is even more important now than it ever was. I also have, from a private perspective, a very strict uh, view of application security. And every single time when an application asks me that I should actually type in my credit card details, I'm getting a little bit agitated, to be, to be quite frank. If it is only in transactional data, that's okay, but I don't want to have my credit card details, for example, in master data, where it's much easier from a hacking perspective to actually explore that. So I'm going to share a few of my stories that I have discovered in my last 11 years in Australia um, as well and how security is taken here. So to start with a few fast facts about SAP, I'm pretty sure most of you would have heard about SAP. We are a leading global enterprise software company with our headquarter in Waldorf, Germany. 77,000 employees in 130,000 countries. I'm not reading out the rest to you. You can actually see that on screen. I think what you probably might not know is that we obviously also, as a global enterprise software company, have a fair amount of internal development systems that we actually have to trade and to basically consider when we think about security. So as you can see on the right-hand side, we have around 8,500 development systems for traditional SAP on-premise software, which is mainly, you know, ERP, CRM, SR, SCM, and so on. But you also have around 500 SAP cloud development systems. Of course, security, specifically in cloud solutions, are very, very hot topics, so we have to look after that. And we have also around 40 internal SAP business systems. So we have a big development landscape, and that's where also challenges are coming from. How can we actually tackle that in a way that as the organization, we get the full picture what the security status of our software basically is before we give it out to our customers. So what I want to spend is the next few minutes is just to talk a little bit about the history um, about application security and how it has changed recently. So you might remember in the past, and probably a few, a few of you might actually really remember these days, most attacks were actually dedicated through the network to actually gain access to our internal systems and then, of course, to you know, any kind of assets of this organization. Over the last years, and I have not seen an organization on this, on, in this world that hasn't actually protected themselves from a network and infrastructure perspective. So we have switch and router security that is deployed. We have firewalls, of course. We're using VPN to actually have secure ways from remote to actually go into our internal networks. And, of course, we're using antivirus and anti-spam just to talk a few measures that we have taken. But what has happened is also that the cyber attacks are actually now have changed too. They know we are quite good protected on these sides. So what they are focusing on is directly on the application layer to access intellectual property, to access our customer data, trade secrets, and so on. And according to Gardner, we have now 84% of all breaches that occur at the application layer itself. So now when we think about that, we have seen 84%, that's already a pretty high number. But when we look at a few more um, numbers and facts here, then we also see that 56% of these security weaknesses reveal information about the application or the user. So that makes it highly critical with high impact. So we definitely have to deal about it. 
And then also from a mobile application perspective, 75% of mobile applications pay basic security tests. And we have seen 68% of increase in mobile application vulnerability disclosures. So a specific area where attackers go to now is also mobile applications. It's not just the traditional web applications any longer. So why do we have that? <clears throat> well, I actually have a little bit of development background as well, and that comes goes back to my IBM 36 time, so I actually learned COBOL. Um, and I can tell you all what I learned, how to actually program code in COBOL was purely focused about how do you create the functional code. And there was also a little bit of thinking, how do you actually create code that performs to the expectations that the organization has. There was not a lot of talking about how do we actually secure the application itself. So how can I secure an input field so that it is not basically can be attacked with SQL injection? How do I do that? We didn't really discover that. And we still see that a lot around. So we still have developers out there that, that have never been really trained. And this is also one of the things that SAP takes very strict. We train our developers on a very regular basis. We update them with, you know, what are new challenges that we have seen around application security? What are new measurements that we have to be taken? So it's one of the highest priority within SAP from a security perspective to have our, our developers trained to the highest standards to actually create the best secure code that they can. On the other hand, we have in most organizations nowadays security professionals, but they are just purely overwhelmed by the amount of applications they have to basically do security testing on. I'll give you an example of an organization here in Australia. When we spoke to them, they, they said to us, we have around 1,200 business applications that we actually should do security testing on. And it's just too much to really do. So they had to do some priority, pri prioritization, which ones to start with, where is the most critical data, what is the asset, in which system that they have to protect the most. And I think this is actually exactly the problems that we as organizations facing um, that causes application security vulnerabilities in the first place. And I think we're all slowly going forward to actually make that better for everybody. I wanted to actually now pass it to the first polling question, and I would appreciate if you can reply to this. So here we have uh, our first polling question of the evening. Is application security an important topic to your organization? Um, please uh, select one of the answers, yes, no, or you don't know. And we'll give you a few minutes to um, put your answers in to the polling question, and then we'll. Um, report the results. Okay. Um, shouldn't take us very long to get all these answers in. I'll give you about another 15 seconds to get your answers in. And we should be able to see the results. Okay, so the results are in and uh, obviously, uh, as we might all expect, 96% um, have uh, selected yes application security is a very important topic to their organization and uh, only 4% have uh, answered no. Uh, back to you, Barbara. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I'm pleased with, I'm pleased with this result. Um, it, we see that changing over the last few years and I'm pleased that we're now coming to close to 100% that application security is an important topic nowadays. So what causes software security problems in the first place? And I looked that up on Wikipedia, and I really like the description that they, that they put forward, that I put forward for software security problems. So all security vulnerabilities in software are the result of security bugs or defects within the software. Pretty clear and straightforward. In most cases, these defects are created by two primary causes. The first one is the non-conformance or failure to satisfy requirement. That can happen. 
And actually, I'm not too concerned with, with that one because that means for minimum we have thought about security when we did our requirements. The second one is the one where I think we all as organizations have to do more shifts and SIP actually has applied that and I'm coming to that um, a little bit later, is really that security is not something that is even in consideration when we starting our design and requirement documents for software to be built. So it is really important for organizations to apply um, this as automatic requirements for every single project we're going forward that not only functionality, user access control, um, performance, but also application security, protecting fields and authorization sites and so are actually in there. So it's really important. So what we hear quite often from our SIP customers is they say, well, I have all my SIP applications in house. So only my internal users can access. All right, um, back to the presentation. So what we hear quite often from our customers as SAP is they're saying, well, my SAP applications are all in-house, so only my internal users can access the systems. Well, also for SAP, this has changed dramatically. Since we, um, since we brought out the ECC system, which was funded with the portal, for example, we have nowadays really most customers also with traditional ERP systems having web or mobile access to these systems. So it's not really the internal users any longer. The second um, argument we hear quite often is we have implemented access control mechanisms. So only the users that are supposed to do a business process can actually do that. But what we're going to see quite soon is even if I have access control mechanism in place, if the code underneath has security vulnerabilities in it, then I can actually still breach into the system and extract data or manip manipulate data in a way that I'm not supposed to. And as you see as well, um, internal fraud, unfortunately, this is a figure from 2011, was around 7%, and it is currently growing. Um, and this might not be necessary that people do it on purpose. Yeah, this can also happen just by accident. And they actually, you know, push the button, type something in that they didn't want to do. So it's not all on purpose, but we have Unfortunately, now there's also like revenue impact from an internal fraud perspective. So let me show you an example of how a security vulnerability in a code base could look like and what the impact is that a user can actually get through using this security vulnerability. So this is an um, ABAP example, so just to let you know. So it looks a little bit like the classic SAP environment, but I'm pretty sure you will, you will understand the message quite easily. So the example we see here is we have an employee self-service portal and all our users in the organization, of course, should be able to change their address when they are moving. So we go into the screen, change your address. We see our home address, we see our phone, and we see our salary, so some of the master data. And then we can also type in street, zip code, city, and phone when we're moving. And that's exactly what we did. So the address was changed. And we see that reflected in the home address as part of the master lab. So now if the user moves again, this time he moves into a street that is called O single quote Hara number six. And we get a very different result from the SAP system. And it tells us that the contained field name Hara does not exist in any of the database tables. So our user is a clever one and it thinks, Hmm, if there is a field Hara that is not there, maybe there's a field salary in the database. So he's using the same technique with the old single quote, salary as the field name, and then gives it a value. And what we see when he executes the transaction, the address was changed. That's the message from the system. But when we look at the home address, then we see it got truncated. And when we look at the salary, it got increased. So this is an example for SQL injection, which is one of the top five security vulnerabilities for the last 10 years and more, according to OVAS. So this is where actually bypassing the application logic, directly communicating into the database and executing commands in the database. So this was one of the examples how this could be done. Of course, I'm pretty sure in none of our organizations that would, this would be really possible. Let's have a look at some other considerations, how internal only applications could be attacked. So we have our 
SAP application, and we're on premise. We have seen already the unintentional, or maybe you know, even employees that actually did it on purpose to change some of these data. We have seen that too. But what could also happen is we can actually get attacked through through email. And we just recently in SAP again got an alert where where it was said, please be very careful. We are currently under attack. Emails are sent to SAP employees. If you're not 100% sure where this email is coming from and it has an attachment, please do not open this attachment. So what, what happens is sometimes and you know, antivirus um, and anti-spam um, emails will, will not be picked up. So if that makes it through and one of our employees actually opens it, and it could be something that looked like a you know, very easy PDF and nothing should happen, there could be malicious code behind it. And that could be, for example, a keylogger. So any time we're typing anything in, it would actually lock the keystrokes. And that is one of the ways how cyber attacks happen nowadays and one of the easy ways they're actually using to basically get a possibility through an email planting code on a desktop machine or on a laptop and then basically get the information sent back, what this user is actually doing to expose our user ID and passwords, for example. We can also have, we have, we have people leaving in the organization, so we have to make really sure was the access revoked and deactivated. Was that actually a friendly employee that was leaving us, or might he actually left some logical bombs and trapped to us? I'll give you an example for that. For example, if a developer leaves and um, not in the, in the friendliest way, what could happen is that at a specific time and date, some malicious code get executed, and that could do some sort of you know, either deleting master data, for example, that could also do money transfer for, for, for this kind of story. So we have to make sure that our code is protected against these logic bombs and these trap doors as well. And last but not least, we also have to consider that we're quite often actually getting contractors on board. Now we don't know, you know, all the time, did we really have a full security validation with them? So that exposes us also as an organization. Last but not least, we should not forget, forget it is not just one single system any longer. All the, the, the business processes that we are running nowadays as organizations, as an end-to-end -end process, touch different systems. So it's not just SAP. You might have a mobile front end in the beginning that might actually, or a web front end, and that might actually communicate to an SAP system to actually get data. That might actually communicate to a legacy system um, to run the end-to-end business process. What we have to do is really to protect all the applications. And specifically, when we think about to secure an application, we have to understand the components and also the connected applications. So that is really important. It cannot be just we only actually secure our web applications. We only secure our SAP system. We really have to think about the critical business processes that we are running and how we basically protect the full-on end-to-end business process. Because when we look at that, only one flaw is enough to actually break into a system. So it's not just that we need to have 100, one single one could actually do. And with new technologies, we always find new vulnerabilities. And that's exactly what we saw before, that for example, um, mobile applications have so high failure rates from a security perspective. It's new technologies. It seems with every single time we, we reinvent the wheel, you know, when some new technology comes out. I actually went through that personally when we had all the nice standards from a CC++ perspective. And everybody knew how, how you would actually develop and that, and then Java came along. And everything changed again. And this is still happening the same. So now if we basically have development for Android or for iOS, again, everything is a little bit different. All right, this brings me to the second polling question. So, um, for all of you that are um, still with us, uh, the second polling question is, who in your organization is responsible for application security? Please select one of the following uh, choices. The development team, the security team, the uh, chief security officer or head of security, or I don't know. So, we'll give you a few minutes here to to uh, answer some of those questions. And uh, please select just one of those um, four choices. Okay. 
Okay. I'm watching the uh, answers come in. Have a few more people that still need to vote. Give us their um, their answers. Well, I don't see any more answers coming in, so I'm going to say that uh, we're going to close the poll. And the answers are 24% um, have responded that development is responsible for application security. 35% uh, have responded the security team is responsible. 24% have said uh, the chief security officer, and 18% have responded don't know. So it's pretty uh, pretty well spread across all four um, uh, responses, Barbara. Back to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's 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 interesting, and that's also something that that we have seen over time. Hypothetically, there should be you know obviously several teams responsible. We didn't allow you to actually do a multi-selection. Um, but in theory, from a responsibility perspective, there should be development security, of course. And I think the one that is accountable as well should be the um, CSO or the head of security. So there's many, many actually involved, and they all ideally would work together as a team. And then we have the best security outcome. Okay, so the typical approach that we see to application security is the following. So we're building our software, we deploy it, we have a breach, or we do a penetration test with an external organization, and somebody then actually tells us as a result, the code is actually not secure. So we're obviously convinced then and actually pay to fix it. What that does from a um, cost perspective is, if we discover security vulnerabilities after it has been deployed, it's 30 times higher than if we find it during requirement phase or design and architecture. And even 23 times higher, than if you can still find it in coding. So the, the, the approach should be different. And the approach that SAP has um, embraced is really a systematic proactive approach. So we're talking about, we have security embedded into the development process and actually start even before the development process. And I'm coming back to that in a little bit more detail. We also are leveraging security gates. And we do that at several, several steps during the software development life cycle to enforce and ensure that the software that we're building is secure before we actually give it out to our customers. Of course, we also have to monitor it. And then while we are monitoring it, always improving our policies because there is new security vulnerabilities that are getting discovered. So this is a proactive approach, um, exactly how SIP has embedded it, and that's also what we're recommending to our customers to use. So it is all about software security assurance, and it stands on three pillars. Number one is a process. So we need to have actually a process enforced in the organization that defines exactly what are the different steps that have to be undertaken to secure the software. The second thing is we have different people involved. So this is now across a whole organization. So we have program managers, pro project managers, development team lead, developers, security team, so they should all work hand in hand, but they have different responsibilities. And as I said before, some of them are responsible, some should be consulted, some should be informed, like testing teams, for example, and somebody should be accountable. So we basically can put a tick on the box in the end and say, like, yes, exactly, we have actually gone through it. And then last but not least, we need solutions. When you think back in the beginning, I was talking about we had 850 internal development systems. If you try to actually do manual code reviews and you know penetration testing on a manual approach, it is just too hard to actually really do it. So we need solutions that can help us to be more efficient and really foster the process that, that we have set in stone that should be followed. So this is now how SIP addresses application security internally, and this is specifically around the process. So when you see underneath, our software development lifecycle has different stages. So we have invent, define, development, validation, deploy, and optimize as part of the um, stages. 
what we have introduced is several of these security or queue gates. And in all of these queue gates, specific mandatory actions have to happen to actually verify that we have, that we are on the way to pro program secure software. So when I'm looking at the first queue gate, and you might be probably surprised to actually see that before we even go into development, this is all about a security plan. And this is a mandatory activity that has to be done in the development in SAP. So as part of our security plan, we are describing the security requirements and how they will be implemented during development. So it's clearly already defined before we already have started developing. These are actually the rules we're going to follow. These are, you know, all the, for example, authorization checks that we're going to put in the in input validations and so on. So we have a proper plan. Then in the next stage as development, we are really making sure that these security controls that we had defined in the security plan are also actually taken into consideration from development. So this works quite nicely together. So we have actually made sure when you think about the definition um, that we had why security vulnerabilities are actually happening in the first place. So this is really, we have the requirements, we have made the plan, and now in the next stage in development, we basically follow this plan and execute it accordingly. Then we have the second queue gate after development, that is security testing. And when we, when we look at security testing done by a security testing team, they actually validate that the security plan that we defined in the first queue gate, when we had to actually do that plan, was followed. So did we actually, all the measures that we, that we defined for this specific development, were they actually followed? What also happened during, during security testing is additional static and dynamic security testing, depending on what the application is. So we do static security testing for all applications, but for some we also do dynamic. So this is our next gate to just make sure the code is actually secure. So then we come into the validation phase, which is all the testing. And also as part of validation, we have another queue gate which is the security validation. And in the security validation, we're checking that the security report and the security risk assessment have actually been executed and also work against the security plan we had in the beginning. Again, also in this queue gate or security gate, we run additional security tests. And depending on the risk assessment that actually comes in at this stage, this could be taking several weeks. Um, this could be just taking, you know, if it's a small little and not very risk-related application, this could be also be just a small little um, assessment on the scope. So it just depends where, where we are. And this is exactly what we have embraced. Um, it is really, really important to have this process in place because if you don't have the process in place and it's been fostered, the likelihood that any of um, you know, security testing that happens in the organization might potentially not come to the desired result. So it is really important, and that is exactly why SAP has embraced this process with all the different security gates. So just to make sure that all the software that we are delivering to our customers has been tested, is secure, we have all the audits for it, we can prove that we have done all this testing. So this is to protect, obviously, you know, our customers, this is also to protect SAP as a brand. So what we are using in-house is for all products that are um, developed in a language that Fortify supports, HPE Fortify, we are scanning all the source codes for security requirements. And we're using the source code analysis for it. All the findings have to be audited and all exploitables have to be fixed. Yeah. There's also, of course, dates underneath. So this, of course, would then be defined. What is the starting date for development? And five months later, after that start date, we actually want to release this software to the, to the customer. So we're using Fortify quite heavily. In the next slide, I'm going to show you what are the typical people that are actually involved when we are talking about a project. So SIP is running a project. We are building some custom code for customers, for example. So we have the developer, of course. Um, we have the security expert, as you would imagine. But we also have Scrum Master and Build Master as part of our security team, too. 
So what are their roles and how are they accessing Fortify to actually help us to make sure that the software is, is secure? So the developer, they're using the IDE plugins, they're using the, the audit workbench, they're using SCA, of course using back track, track systems if something, um, if they're fine. But everything is linked into the Fortify server. And in the Fortify server, we consolidate all this information from the different people and teams that are involved to actually make sure we have actually done and followed the process that we have established within SAP. So we have the developer. The Scrum Master is more looking into 45 from a web browser perspective to see what security tests have been done, what gates have we actually passed before we can go forward. The security expert, that is the guy that actually needs to have the expertise not only in the language that we are developing, so quite often in um, SAP terms that could be Java, when we think about our Java platform, um, but they also need to have a good security expertise. And they will actually help us to do the second security gate that we talked about before, after we have development, to really make sure that all the security measurements that were defined in the security plan have been implemented. And then we also have the build master. And this is really to enforce, after we have used these gateways, that the code can actually only go into the next stage, which is on the build system, if it has passed an additional security test. So this is how this comes together. And when you see the Fortify server underneath, we actually have over 4,000 projects that we monitor consistently on Software Security Center as part of the Fortify suite. So we are quite large user of the Fortify tools within SAP. And the solutions that we are using. So we are basically doing, and I mentioned that before, static as well as dynamic application security testing. We're using automated source code analysis and automated application vulnerability scanning from this regard. And the solutions that we have in place with the platform underneath, we talked about it, 45360 server, is SAP 45 by H for all the languages that we're using in SAP that are supported. And we're also using a product from SAP itself. It's called SAP NetWeaver Application Server Add-on for Code Vulnerability Analysis. That is specifically just looking after ABAP code, whereas for 45, we're using 45 for all non-ABAP code. And when we are speaking to our customers, because we also resell the 45 suite, they can also use it for the non-SAP custom applications that they have. So this is a product bundle that is in use within SAP. So we're using 45 for like specifically the Java um, platform, for example, and we're using PDA around the ABAP stack. I'm going to go a little bit briefly through that. Um, this is just a few like highlights how, how these tools um, are used and how they work. So important for us from an SAP perspective was we needed to make it as easy for the developer to consume as possible. So CDA, the same as also SCA, Source Code Analyzer, have IDEs, have plugins. So the developer doesn't have to go anywhere else to actually do source code. There's nothing that has to be normally exported. They can just basically, in Java Eclipse, for example, they can use the IDE while they're creating their code and actually execute the checks. The same exactly applies for, for CDA. And the information that we're getting back from the developer is what are the security vulnerabilities that were found? What is the line of code where it was discovered with the data flow analysis? And what is it that we should be doing? So this is how it looks from an ABAP perspective, and you see this is a, a typical ABAP screen in the background, but this is exactly the same from a 45 perspective, how we use it. So it was important for us that it is easy to consume for the developer, no exporting of code, no Googling around, you know, what does, does this security vulnerability mean? No, you know, jumping around code lines, where do we find it? So that is exactly one of the reasons why SAP has chosen 45 to use for our static code scanning. We're also using WebInspect, um, and that's specifically against web applications and web services. And this is really running um, ethical hacking attacks against these services when they are built and running already in pre-production to actually also find some security vulnerabilities that, are ca that cannot be actually seen in the code itself, that actually only come to life with the data that are fitted in, in a running application. And last but not least, one of the most important pieces of that suite for us is Software Security Center. This is what we're using quite heavily um, from a reporting perspective. 
and again, I'm not sure if you, if you might have heard, Germany has actually now security regulations in place that, um, that an organization has to prove that security testing has been done. And that is exactly what we're using this audit platform for. So we can basically show for every single software development that happens in SAP, these are all the different security tests that were executed, these are the results, these are all the security vulnerabilities that were found, and how they were fixed before that actually went forward. So this is also something mandatory we do. Brings me to the third polling question. Okay, Barbara. Um... Uh, for this polling question, we're going to ask you, what are, the, what are you doing in your organization to improve the security at an, at, at an application level? And uh, for this question, we're going to ask you to please select all that apply. Um, the choices are penetration testing, focused on perimeter defenses, firewalls, encryption, etc., periodic manual code reviews, application security testing program in place and enforced. And the fifth choice would be um, don't know. So please try to select all the things that you believe your organization is doing to try to improve security at an application level. And I can see that some of our responses are coming in already. Uh, give everybody about another 10 seconds to try to get all their answers um, submitted. Okay. Um, looks like we have about... Um, a very mixed uh, response here, which is what I would have expected to see. Um, looks like 38% are performing some type of penetration testing. 54% are also focused on the perimeter defenses. 46% uh, are also doing the periodic manual code reviews. And 62% state that their application security testing programs are in place and are being enforced only 8% um, have responded that they're not sure. So back to you, Barbara. Thanks, thanks, Robert. That is a very, very pleasing result, I have to say, um, with 64% saying that application security programs are in place and enforced. So this, this, is, this is great news. Um, that's, that's exactly the way how we, how we should be working as organizations nowadays. So I wanted to share a few more lessons learned um, that we had on our journey around application security. So developers by default are not necessarily really keen to see potential issues. They only want to focus on bugs. So prove it to me, this is a bug, and I will actually fix it. But when we talk about security, there's also potential issues, depending on what data is coming in that might actually raise something. So we have to actually raise their awareness around potential issues too. The audit should really be done by a security expert. So we need somebody who has the understanding of the language, the programming language we are using, plus really has a deep knowledge what security vulnerabilities are and what kind of risks they are exposing. Build experts usually don't really care about security that much. It is just another tool that they have to integrate. So you have to see it this way. It's not really an immediate benefit for them coming out of this. This just means like before we can actually create the next build, there's another solution that has to be run and spits out a result that we actually have to take care of. So they see it as a little bit more additional work, but that is why we have to process and this is why this has to be enforced and this has to be done. Um, do not introduce code scanning in a brute force manner. And I think that that's probably pretty clear. We have to do this in stages because when we actually start with um, static code analysis, in the beginning, there is probably a likelihood that we might find a fair amount of findings in high priority. So we have to try this really in a staged approach. Which ones are the ones that are the most critical for the organization? Which one can we actually fix first? 
if we just come back and say, like, oops, there's 500 security vulnerabilities in your code base to one developer, and you have to fix that within, you know, a week, they will just like, wow, that's just a little bit too much. So we need, we really need to work together. Um, find out which ones are the ones we can actually concentrate on first, which ones have the highest risk and really go there. And do not under, underestimate that you need to have human resources and you have infrastructure to actually do so. So we have the, as you saw, the 45 server that we are running with over 4,400 projects. There is actually capacity that has to be set up and there is a lot of different people that are involved in these processes. So we also actually, just to cater that in from the beginning, there might be some effort in this regard. So just as before I'm coming to my closing slide, um, just SIP runs SIP. So I'm giving you two, how we are using CVA as well as Fortify. So with CVA, we have actually scanned more than 500 million lines of ABAP code. And we're working with that internally consistently. And the same also from the 45 perspective, and this was in 2012, so the number is higher now because we have done, of course, much more development since. But also in 2012 already, we had performed static analysis on approximately 178 million lines of code. So now when you think about it, if we have to do that in a manual fashion, we would probably still be working on it. We needed to have a solution like 45 in place that can actually help us to find security vulnerabilities early in the life cycle, ideally during development, and then prove it through the different queue gates that nothing is actually still in the code before we ship it to our customer. So as a summary, the way to secure, um, to secure your custom code, one weakness is enough to put the business at risk. We have to really keep this in mind. We have to train our developer on a real regular basis. And I mentioned that before, this is a very, very hot topic for SIP. So we do that quite intensively. And um, we have to update them with the latest security vulnerabilities that were found. We have to update them how we actually, you know, counterpart that to actually have already secure programming in place in the first time. And don't expect that security is something that we do once off. So a once or twice a year penetration test will probably not secure your application for the simple fact that we have more than one or two changes going into these applications on a, on a basis, specifically now with the whole agile approach the frequency of upgrades and updates and modifications to applications are getting much higher. So we need to have something that we actually really can apply consistently to make sure that our source code is safe, that our web applications are penetration tested in a, in a timely manner, and we basically always have this information in hand so we can create the most secure code. And that's my last polling question. So um, our final polling question for this webinar uh, this evening or this day is, do you want to be contacted by an SAP or HPE representative to have a detailed discussion to take this forward, addressing the, the, um, the topic of security as it pertains to your applications uh, for your business? And uh, please just select yes or no, and if you if you select yes, I'm sure somebody from SAP or HP will follow up with you after the webinar. If not, please feel free to just, you know, visit the slides and share them with uh, people in your organization. Uh, so right now we have uh, responses coming in. We'll give you about 10 seconds to respond, yes or no. And give another, another few seconds. And five more seconds. And I think we have um, most of the answers in. So um, we don't have to um, we don't have to share those answers right now. Uh, those of you that have selected yes, you'll be contacted as you requested. Those that you have responded no, we'll just honor your request and um, look forward to hearing from you sometime in the future. Uh, back to you, Barbara. Thank you. So that was the last polling question we had. That was actually also the end of my presentation. And I would like to open it up. Um, I was running a little bit more than I expected to, um, to open it up for question and answer. Shomi, maybe you Thank can you. assist me there. 
Yeah, indeed. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Barbara. I, I would like to, to thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation uh, for you and SAP. Um, also, a couple of words, I guess, whilst, we, uh, whilst you actually put your questions into the question pane. Um, uh, as Barbara mentioned earlier, cybersecurity is becoming a very hot topic nowadays. The stakes are real and uh, becoming higher, as you all probably uh, noticed. Uh, the latest Panama Papers uh, event has, uh, has obviously shown that uh, the, the stakes can actually be pretty severe. Um, attackers are also becoming a lot more sophisticated and are exploiting new ways to uh, to steal and monetize information. Um, and as we move into cloud and mobile, uh, and with a rapid uh, pace of change and, and also moving into agile and DevOps, uh, software vulnerabilities are really becoming the entry point for attackers, uh, as opposed to network and infrastructure. Uh, and unfortunately, organizations are still focusing security at the infrastructure layer. Uh, and, um, for example, just a couple of stats, according to Gartner, only 3% of an IT security budget uh, is spent on application security, whilst, again, more than 80% of attacks are actually within the software layer. Uh, and so, obviously, there's a big discrepancy there. Um, but we are actually seeing a change in the market. And I've been in that market for over seven years, just specifically with Fortify, uh, helping customers uh, put together uh, application security programs. And uh, I'm actually seeing that change in the market where uh, as awareness increases, more organizations are starting to allocate more funding and resources uh, and starting to leverage automation to uh, mainly building security very early into the software supply chain. Uh, and I guess as a last, uh, last word, I urge you all to basically ask yourselves two questions. Uh, the first one is, can you trust the software that you have in your organization and also the software that you will develop uh, in the future? Uh, and the other question is, do you actually have a proactive approach um, that is clear and measurable and more importantly, systematic and repeatable uh, to securing your software within the organization? Um, and uh, with that, let me have a look at uh, uh, the questions that we have. Um, Barbara, one question that uh, you can probably answer, um, does Fortify support mobile applications um, as opposed to just SAP? Yes, it does, it does. Um, it, it's not just SAP, it's basically 24 plus languages and also including Android. And that was also one of the important parts for SAP. We also have mobile applications that we develop um, connecting into our SAP system. So we also needed something actually that can test the devices and applications on that too. Fantastic. And um, the second question I'm happy to answer. So the second question that we have is, uh, can Fortify be used uh, directly within the IDE or only after you've actually uh, created the code? Um, the answer is actually both. Uh, you can uh, use Fortify within the IDE to figure out exactly what uh, is wrong with your code. Um, and in fact, if you're developing specifically to Java, um, you will be able to actually see it in line as you type. Um, the other thing is you can also scan it after the fact when you compile the application or in between as part of your build process, as a part of an automated process. And so. What I urge you all to do is if you're thinking about integrating static analysis and want to approach either SAP or HP, uh, please talk to us and we'd be more than happy to actually run uh, solution architecture workshops to try and see where would it actually make more sense to integrate static analysis and, and security testing into your process. Um, with that, I don't have any further questions. So, Robert, I'll pass on to you to uh, to finalize the the webinar. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank everybody that attended tonight. I especially want to thank Barbara from SAP for her uh, excellent presentation on the uh, security implications that we all have to deal with today in our IT environments. I want to thank uh, Shlomi from uh, HP Fortify and uh, Frederick, who also is from HP Security. I want to thank uh, the whole Vivid organization, Anne Marie, and um, the, the whole Vivid organization for uh, orchestrating this and uh, presenting it. 
And um, if we can go on to the next slide, I think there's a few wrap-up things that uh, we want to cover. So for those of you that uh, are aware of this and can attend, there will be the HP Discover uh, event in Las Vegas, as I affectionately call Lost Wages. But it's actually Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, June 7th to 9th. And uh, many of us will be there. I'll be attending and uh, working with HP and Vivid at that event in, um, in Las Vegas. So we'd like to see some of you there if you can make it. And obviously, if you can't make the Las Vegas event, there is always one later in the year held somewhere else in the world. I'm not exactly sure where the uh, next event would be, but uh, next slide. So I want to thank you all for uh, attending tonight. Again, remember that you can, visit, you can visit the Vivid website in a couple of days. The slides, the recording of this webinar, and the questions and answers will be posted there. If you would be so kind as to complete the short survey, um, that, um, that, that will pop up after this webinar. That would be great. And if you'd like to get more information, you can use one of the links below. Uh, hpe.com or the vivid-worldwide.org. And again, we thank you for your time tonight. Have a great day, and uh, thank you for participating. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. That concludes.